So, so I'm representing AAC or Boston, which is our uh, na neighborhood network of cancer researchers. So um, what, what our organization is, we are a 501c3 nonprofit, so feel free to, to donate to us. I feel like a presidential candidate, aacrboston.org. Um, so, so what we do is um, we're intending to host networking activities, but we sponsor two named lectures in, in the Boston area. Um, the Apfel lecture and also to today's lecture, the, the Sager Memorial M M Memorial Lecture. So this lecture was endowed by uh, Dr. Art Pardee, an eminent cancer researcher that many of you know, in the memory of his late wife, uh, Ruth Sager, herself a cancer researcher and the first woman full professor at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. So Ruth, during her career, made uh, lots of contributions to tumor suppressor genes, oncogenes, and, and cancer, and she was a very dedicated scientist. The story is, is that she uh, was writing a grant and a paper in the last week of her life. So that's pretty, pretty amazing to me. So, so she's clearly driven by science, but she's also a very well-rounded individual with lots of interest in art and music and a dedication towards training, um, uh, to training students and fellows. M many of her tra trainees are, are, are spotted through science to, to today. So um, Art uh, Pardee, <coughs> who usually comes, but is not here today, endowed this lecture in her memory, and it's to honor each year uh, each year that we have it, an outstanding cancer researcher and an outstanding human being. So t t today in Steve Elledge, we, we, we have both qualities. So Steve is, um, is an exceptionally accomplished cancer researcher that m many of you know his work in the cell cycle and, and DNA damage. And his work is characterized always by innovation and creativity and rigor. So, so, so we've enjoyed um, uh, uh, we've enjoyed his many f fundamental discoveries. So, so let me give you something of his background. So Steve graduated from the University of, of, of Illinois, summa cum laude, and, um, and he got his PhD at MIT and did postdoctoral work at Stanford. He started as an assistant professor at Baylor University and rose to the ranks, and in 2003, I think, something like that, so, so sometime in the early 2000s, moved to Harvard Medical School in the Department of Genetics, and he's been an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So, so, so Steve, as I said, has made many contributions to the cell cycle, so if you ever run into the P21 molecule, Steve discovered that. Um, and he's continued an, an amazing career. If you look at his CV over 300 some pu publications, the majority of them are in the hot, highest profile journals uh, in, in our field. Um, so, so Steve is a member of the National <coughs> Academy, the recipient of, of many prizes, uh, the Paul Marx Cancer Prize, uh, the, the Gardner Foundation Award, and the Lasker Award. But to give you an idea of the type of person Steve is, so, so we all appreciate his he, and you won't need to retaliate against me. It's nice. <laughs> He's looking at me. We all all appreciate his his intellectual brilliance. There is no question about that. But I I, I think m m many of us that know him well know him as a very solid solid in, in, individual and person. So I'm looking at his CV. Has all these amazing prizes, National Academy member and such. But then there's also a couple others that are just thrown in there. I don't know if he put them in there to see if I was really reading his CV or not, but, but, but two of them are the Mayo Middle School Hall of Fame and, and, and the city and the keys to the city of Paris, Paris, Illinois. So, 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 <laughs> so, so, so Steve was raised and uh, uh, born and raised in, in, in Paris, Illinois. And actually, I think that explains a lot. I think he told me once his favorite a uh, toy was a chemistry set. I think he says something about creating a stain on his, his mother's ceiling or, or something like that. But, but Steve embodies those great Midwestern values. He's a solid individual. He's a tremendous amount of fun to talk science with. And, 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 and I know him reasonably well. He is a, uh, a wonderful person, um, husband, father, 
son, bro brother, and, and, and friend. And in the spirit of Ruth Sager, Steve has a lot of different interests as well. Um, he also has an interest in music, but maybe not the same kind of music as Ruth Sager. So, so Steve has a hum humongous uh, uh, iTunes library with the likes of Dylan, McCartney, and, and others in it. So, um, so, so uh, 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 in the spirit of the Sager Memorial Lecture, we, we honor an exceptional uh, cancer biologist and a, a great uh, and, a, and a wonderful human being as well. So, so let's welcome Steve Ellich from Harvard Medical School <coughs> by Highway of Paris, I I Illinois. Steve. Thanks. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. Um, I do have a, a great interest in music. Um, I went to the Desert Trip concert last weekend, so weekend, two weekends ago, for those of you who are familiar with that. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some work that we're doing on trying to understand aneuploidy and its role in driving cancer. And I'll take you through some of the studies we've published in the last couple of years, and then I'll, in the first third of the talk, and then I'll go into um, uh, some of the unpublished work, hopefully soon to be published. Um, so, so this is going to be um, a talk with not a lot of experiments. There are a couple of experiments in it, the first and the last. Uh, but um, uh, two slides will have that. But it's, a, it's an integration of a lot of different data sets. And this sort of gives you an example of what you can do with data that's mostly just sitting out there waiting to be looked at. We start with RNA high proliferation screens. Uh, we do cancer uh, driver mutations, aneuploidy patterns also focal events in the genome. And we end up with RNA-seq analysis and, and uh, putting that together with patient survival data. So if we think about how uh, normal cells are transformed into cancer cells, uh, we think about uh, the occasional deletion or amplification, but mostly we think of mutation in driver genes or uh, gene silencing or chromosome rearrangements that convert a normal cell into a cancer cell. But um, what's, what's uh, missing uh, from this uh, is, is the elephant in the room, which is aneuploidy. And so aneuploidy was really the first hallmark of cancer. And, um, but people don't talk about it very much, and in part because it's difficult to think about. If you look at a cancer cell, they have lots of different types of aneuploidies. It looks like someone threw a hand grenade in the genome. It's really hard to interpret as opposed to focusing on an individual gene as a driver of RAS or uh, P53, something like that. So uh, people generally ignored it and don't talk about it very much. Um, but about 100 years ago, it was as soon as the light microscope could discover or look at chromosomes, uh, it, was, it was found that uh, tumor cells had the wrong number of chromosomes. And this is Theodore Bovary. Uh, and uh, he was studying sea urchin development. Um, and he discovered centrosomes. And he's been credited with the chromosomal theory of inheritance because uh, he found that when a chromosome number was uh, uh, incorrect during development, it completely messed up sea urchin development. Um, and so, uh, anyway, so in 1914, he hypothesized, he, uh, hypothesized that the aneuploidy could be responsible for the characteristics of tumor cells. And in particular, he said that, that specific chromosome constitutions could be produced such that the cells that, that harbored are uh, uh, given to unrestrained proliferation. So this is um, 100 years ago. And, um, and since then, um, there hasn't been a lot of progress in understanding how aneuploidy works. Uh, but we do know that there are specific patterns of, of uh, chromosome gains and losses uh, shown here by a heat map, and also recurring focal events that occur through the chromosome. So, what we don't know is whether these events just happen to occur at a higher frequency and they're tolerated, or whether they're actually drivers of, of tumor genesis. And there have been a couple of, uh, I think, um, experiments that point towards them being drivers, um, uh, one of which was um, is done by uh, mouse modeling of, of spindle checkpoint mutants. So they, they have higher rates of aneuploidy, and they get cancer. And also David Pellman did a nice experiment where he made a a uh, tetraploid cell and showed that that was more tumorigenic than the diploid version of that. Um, so those point in the right direction. But how does it all work? 
And so we started this by doing a very simple thing. We were looking for uh, doing RNAi screens, looking for things that killed tumor cells. And we thought, well, maybe we should also do it on normal cell lines since we don't want to just kill every cell in the body if you find a target. And so we did this with human mammary epithelial cells. We did a very sim simple experiment. We put it in an shRNA library and just said, what makes you proliferate better or worse? And so we got uh, uh, shRNAs that made cells grow faster, and presumably they're turning off an inhibitory gene. So we call these stop genes um, and for suppressors of tumor genesis. If you look in this group, um, they're enriched for tumor suppressors. So a lot of your old friends are in there. Um, and, and then we, the things that drop out were mostly essential genes, but also some oncogenes. And so we call those GO. So stop and GO genes, um, what we were interested in. And we thought, well, maybe there are more um, uh, tumor suppressors in here, some new ones uh, that had been um, um, overlooked, sort of guilt by association. So we mapped, we said, well, which ones would they be? And so we decided to say, to look at recurring deletions, thinking they might be in those. And when we did that, uh, we found that, that we did find a group of, of our stop genes that were in these recurring deletions, but they turned out to be there at a much higher concentration than we expected. And, um, you know, we were looking for the sort of classical two-hit uh, sort of thing. We never found a mutation over these deletions that might pinpoint which one of our genes was the driver. But um, it led to, to the idea that maybe it wasn't a sort of classical two-hit that it was actually something more like a cumulative haploinsufficiency. And I won't go through all the evidence for that, but it's really a very, very strong argument that these deletions are actually working by uh, cumulative haploinsufficiency. And we came up with this model we call the Cancer Gene Island Model for focal deletions and amplifications. And what we found, uh, based on statistical arguments, are that, that regions that are focally deleted and are recurringly focally, focally deleted and cancers are enriched for these negative regulators of proliferation, and they avoid the, the essential genes and the positive regulators, including oncogenes. And, um, and uh, although from that study we didn't show this, but we have now, that focal amplifications are just the opposite. They're enriched in, in oncogene-like genes, and they avoid stop genes, tumor suppressor-like genes. So this is our, this is the model. And, um, we were really interested in whether or not we could um, use this sort of reasoning to try to understand big chromosomal events instead of these small ones. Um, and you can think about these, these parts of the genome as sort of like high-priced real estate. That's where the, the cancer cell gets the biggest bang for its buck um, if you delete that. And if, uh, if you take the whole arm, then you sort of have to take the good with the bad. So, so we were interested in, in trying to, to model this sort of concept of haploinsufficiency and triplosensitivity, which is when you gain a copy of a gene and get a phenotype. Uh, we were trying to model that on, on a whole chromosome aneuploidy or arm aneuploidy, which is a very frequent event. And we decided that the, the, it didn't work with the, the, the genes from the RNAi screen, probably because it's a very messy thing, and also because it only measures one aspect of tumor genesis, which is proliferation, although a very important aspect. Um, so what we did uh, to get a better set of stop and go genes was to actually identify the driver mutations present in, in tumors. And to do that, uh, we took advantage of the, um, the TCGA sequencing effort uh, uh, and built algorithms that allowed us to identify uh, drivers mathematically based on the distortion of their mutational signatures relative to that of a neutral gene. And so uh, you can, we divided all the mutations up into different functional categories, such as null mutations, which are stop um, nonsense mutations, missense mutations, which change an amino acid, uh, and you can actually use uh, programs like Polyphene 2 to predict whether they're deleterious or not, or whether they're benign, and silent mutations. And the idea here is that, um, for example, a tumor suppressor will have a high frequency of, of null and missense relative to silent mutations, relative to a neutral gene, okay? And it's really important that you use the uh, the silent mutations, because it turns out that the mutational background throughout the entire um, genome is not uniform. 
So different parts get mutated at different frequencies and it has to do with heterochromatin and accessibility and transcription coupled repair, things like that. Um, and so if you don't normalize it to the background mutation frequency, then all the giant genes look like they're tumor suppressors and you might have noticed in the early sequencing um, <coughs> um, forays, they predicted these giant genes were tumor suppressors, but they walked that back a little. So having done this, we built this algorithm to do this and we also looked to predict oncogenes based on uh, recurring patterns of, 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 of mutations in particular domains, like think about RAS and things like that. So these oncogenes are often activated, uh, at least the ones you can detect by sequencing, by mutating a specific set of amino acids. And, and oncogenes have very few loss of function mutations, but they have a lot of missense in a particular place. So we did that and we, uh, we found a lot more uh, tumor suppressors and oncogenes than had been previously predicted. And this is sort of what you expect mathematically if you look at more and more tumors, you get a statistically significant um, uh, number of genes that deviate from what a neutral gene would look like. And, um, and so this is just a heat map uh, for the tumor suppressors and oncogenes uh, mapped onto the hallmarks of cancer. And I don't expect that you can read these, but these are different pathways. And I'll just blow up a couple of these so you can just see what we've uh, been finding. So over here on the left, we have a cell cycle regulation module with a lot of your favorite tumor suppressors and oncogenes in it, uh, including the CDK inhibitors and P53 and, and regulators of P53. We have the DNA damage response and uh, cohesin uh, modules here. We also have, of course, all the growth factor uh, response elements. This is the, the RAS, uh, receptor tyrosine kinase, crazy kinase pathway. And importantly, uh, I just want to point out antigen presentation. Now remember when the, the um, uh, TCGA data set is only on primary tumors. So these people have not been treated with therapy yet. You can see there's an active signal for the immune, um, uh, immune system to, to uh, um, respond to cancer, and that will become important later. And also a lot of epigenetic regulators. We've actually now increased the size of the database, we've repeated this, and we're still trying to figure out what's going on, but there are a lot more um, events than even the ones I showed you. So um, how that's to be interpreted, uh, I think will be interesting in the future. So in order to get at this question of, of aneuploidy and how it drives cancer, we decided that we had to give a score to each chromosome arm because what we're interested in is trying to predict the frequency that you observe the loss of that arm or that chromosome across all cancers. And so the way we did it, we set up this chromosome arm score, which we call a charm score for tumor suppressors. And it basically adds up the number of tumor suppressors across a chromosome arm. And um, um, you can't just add up tumor suppressors because then, of course, the bigger arms are going to have more, you know. So uh, we realize that there's a penalty also for deleting something. And there's a proteotoxic stress uh, event that occurs, and this is from work of Angelica and Mon uh, at MIT. Uh, and so to normalize for that, we just divide by the number of genes on the arm. And, um, and also, we don't that simply uh, add up the tumor suppressors because we know some are more potent than others. So we have to weight them based on their potency. And the way we do that is that we, um, we uh, give them a, a, a score based on the distortion of the mutational signatures, which is what we think is just a, a sign of selection. And so the idea here is that, that if you think about the clonal uh, expansion theory of, of evolution of tumors, um, you get a mutation in something like P53 and it causes a overgrowth of a clone of those cells. So they're out competing things. And each one of these cells has additional mutations that you can sample. And the more you have in this clone, the more likely you'll find something and you'll get another mutation and that'll then further expand and then this basically takes the train to the tumor and you detect it when you sequence it. And, um, and so, you know, in, in my mind, uh, I think about cancer just purely mathematically. You don't have to worry about the cell biology of it and stromal interactions and all that complicated stuff. In terms of getting to become a tumor, it's really a math issue. Now, curing it is quite different. 
then the math doesn't matter quite as much. It's still important. But you, you can see here there are other tumor suppressor-like stop genes that are less potent than p53. This one only makes you a clone of 100. This is a log scale. Um, but you'd say, well, you know, you'll never see these in tumors. But that's not true. You'll see them at 1% of the frequency that you see p53. And so the distortion of the mutational signature will be less, but it'll still be distorted. And if you sequence enough tumors, you will be able to find uh, less and less potent tumor suppressors. And I would predict that um, you'll be able to find uh, a mutation that causes a cell to duplicate one time if you sequence enough tumors. But these, of course, are meaningless in terms of therapy. Um, but I think some people really want to get to that point. Uh, <clears throat> so, okay, so we weight them based on the distortion of the mutational signature. We give them a score, and then we look at the correlation. And so this is the, the CHARM tumor suppressor score uh, plotted against the frequency of deletions of these arms across all cancers. And what you can see is that it's kind of noisy, but we get a positive correlation. The p-value is pretty strong. Um, I actually didn't expect it to be this good. It could have been zero or even negative. Okay, so that looked pretty good. This is the more tumor suppressor-like you are, the more likely you are to be deleted. What about amplified? Well, if you look at amplification, it goes in just the opposite direction. The more tumor suppressor-like you are, the less likely you are to be amplified. And that makes sense because this is triple sensitivity. This is, you've got something that restrains proliferation. You make a little bit more of it, it's not good for the tumor. These events happen, they just don't make it out. And so the, they don't take the train to the final tumor. Okay, so you can do that for tumor suppressors. What about oncogenes? Well, for oncogenes, we did the same sort of analysis. And what you can see is that there's a positive correlation. Uh, the p-value is not nearly as good, but the more oncogene-like you are, the, the more likely you are to be amplified. And if you then look at it versus deletions, it goes in the other direction. And that means that these oncogenes, the more oncogene-like you are, the less likely you are to be deleted. That mean, and these are deletion of wild-type oncogenes. That means these, these oncogenes are having an effect um, in their wild-type state because they're regulators of, of proliferation and, and, and survival. And, um, you know, these are, uh, they have some effect normally because they're part of a node that, that is involved in decisions of, of amplification, or sorry, of, of proliferation or not during development uh, or stem cells. So, um, now, remember, the oncogene, the way we predicted oncogenes and tumor suppressors is different, and they're orthogonal. So we can add them together. They're not dependent on each other. So we, we made a combined score um, where we looked at uh, uh, the tumor suppressor score, and then we subtracted an oncogene score, and also a score for essential genes, at least for deletions, essential genes are important. Um, because what we predict is that there's about 30% of all the genes in the genome are haploinsufficient. And probably all tumor suppressors are haploinsufficient because in order to evolve uh, the, the way that, uh, that we think about with respect to the clonal evolution, the first hit has to have a phenotype or you don't expand. Uh, so, you know, the two hit hypo hypothesis really does work for familial cancers, and you see examples of it in, in sporadic tumors, but that's not the only thing going on. And then once you, it, those things have to have an effect on the first hit. But when you combine these, these three things, now you can see the correlation gets much better. And the p value is really good, and the, the r value is about 0.75, which is great. Uh, uh, so the more tumor suppressor like you are, the more likely you are to be deleted, um, and, and uh, the uh, less likely you are to be amplified. The R value is not quite as good here, but um, we know that, it, that we're missing some of the oncogenes, because not all oncogenes can be activated by mutations, and that's the only way you can find them in this particular model. And the weighting's probably not quite right, because you're weighting them on the basis of mutation, uh, but you're counting them uh, 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 with respect to how they behave with triplet sensitivity and uh, things like that. So um, this is for chromosome arms. You get the same sort of event when you do whole chromosomes. And now the R value is 0.8, uh, which means the R square value is about 0.65, which means that about we can explain about 65% of the variance in the uh, frequency of chromosome uh, deletions here. 
based on the distribution of, of, of genes along chromosome arms. Not so well for amplifications, but for deletions, it looks pretty good. So this led us to this model we call the, the gene dosage balance model of cancer, where um, uh, the, the actual distribution of tumor suppressors and oncogenes and essential genes along chromosomes um, um, predicts whether they're likely to be pro-deletion or pro-amplification. Um, and this charm score then helps predict um, the frequency that you see uh, the this various cancer um, karyotypes. So this is part of how, because the aneuploidy can be explained on the basis of, of, of drivers that are activated by point mutation, um, it, it argues very strongly that uh, aneuploidy is driving cancer. Okay. So I wanted to, to, to touch on this dark matter of the genome, the stuff that we don't know about in terms of oncogenes. And these are genes that aren't mutated in cancer per se, but may still drive cancer by virtue of gene expression changes or by amplification. So how do we find these? Um, and so we decided to look for these uh, drivers of proliferation of cancer by doing genetic screen. Um, and to do that, we built a, uh, an ORF library in a TET inducible vector, and we barcoded it. Um, and so we have about 30,000 ORFs that correspond to about 16,000 genes, and it took us a long time to get these. Um, but basically, we barcode this vector randomly. We recombine the libraries in by gateway, and then we sequence, paired in sequence, the ORF to figure out which barcode it's, it's linked up to. You can then put it into a, uh, a cell that has uh, um, a reverse TET transactivator, RTTA, and, and, and then add doxycycline and ask, well, what happens to proliferation? And we've done this for multiple normal cell types, so we do it for normal cells. We don't do it in cancer cells. And this just shows you some examples. This is what we see in terms of the data that comes out. That's really very good. And since we did it randomly, there are multiple barcodes for each ORF, which is really helpful in showing the reproducibility. And this is just now looking at the things that are amplified, and all of a sudden you start seeing things that make a lot of sense. You're getting cell cycle regulators and, and tyrosine kinases and MYC and things like that. So that's good. If you look at um, things that drop out, that's also interesting. So you're starting to see a number of CDK inhibitors here. Um, and we saw interferon genes, a real enrichment for interferon genes because they're very toxic uh, to cells. So, so, and this is, this is that log two, so this is a, a pretty strong dropout um, of these genes. And this is just, you know, the first 70 or 80 genes, but we have 16,000. It just, it's a continuum. Uh, but there are a lot of new genes there. Uh, we took just the, the known cell cycle regulators from the three cell types we looked at, we looked at human memory epithelial cells, we looked at a fibroblast, IMR90 fibroblast, and then pancreatic, normal epithelial pancreatic cells, all of which are immortalized with telomerase, so normal. Uh, and you can see that they correlate pretty well. Um, this just looks at the two different screens. For the cell cycle regulators, they look pretty good. But if you look at the whole data set, you can see here that if you do non-hierarchical clustering, the uh, mammary epithelial and the pancreatic epithelial cells look a lot more like each other than uh, they do like the fibroblasts. So that makes sense. If you, um, we have two libraries that we use together to make up the, this, this set. So a library one, we did all three of these cell types. Library two, we only did two of them. The other cell type got contaminated, so we didn't get the data from it. Um, and my students graduated, so. Oops. Uh, but you can see that one of, the, one of the most interesting things here is that there are vast differences in the proliferation response of different cell types. So there's more overlap between HMEX and, and HPNEs, but you know, between all three of them, there's only three that make this p-value cut off of 0 0.01. Uh, but there's a lot more things in the stop gene category. So it's harder to make them grow better, but it's really a lot easier to make them not grow so well. And I guess that kind of makes sense, because you're hitting core components uh, of, 
of the cell, uh, maybe overproducing something that jams them in an off state. But, um, but anyway, if you just look at these two, uh, there's a lot of overlap here in the things that slow them down, not so much here. And then the question is, why are they so different? And what does that mean? Um, and so we found lots of interesting sets of genes. So in, in breast cancer, we found this whole family of, of uh, um, keratin-associated proteins that cross-link uh, keratin. And there's two subtypes of this, and this is, these are very cysteine-rich proteins. Uh, and those are the ones that score, and the other subtype doesn't score. But you can see we're getting gene after gene that is, is enhancing proliferation very strongly in, in breast only. And if you look at this uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the pancreatic cells, they do nothing. They're, they're just about like the olfactory receptors. They have no signal at all. They have very little signal in IMR90 cells, but they're all very uh, positive here in, in, in mammary epithelial cells. Um, and uh, if you start taking the cell, the, the, the uh, drivers of the different cell types, Something interesting came out when you look at the sort of GO categories, the gene ontology categories. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and what you can see, this is just gives you a heat map based on whether, if you look at whether they're hot, more highly expressed in breast, uh, gene, breast or uh, pancreatic cells, you can see that you're actually picking up um, genes that are activating uh, aspects of that are specific to breast cells here or specific to uh, pancreatic cells over here. Uh, and so it looks like that you're triggering pathways that are, that are really part of the identity of that cell type. And, and so uh, it suggests that there's a sort of underlying uh, genetic architecture uh, in these different cell types that, these, that we're sort of revealing by looking to see what genes you can preserve to turn them on. Um, um, and um, so this is actually very interesting biology. Uh, you can't get to this very easily other ways. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong way. Okay, so if you look at the sort of drivers of proliferation and MAP, tumor suppressors and oncogenes on them, you get some other really interesting things. So this is just a graph that says whether or not it's likely to be dropout or enriched in mammary epithelial cells or pancreatic cells dropout or enriched. And you can see that some of the main drivers of pancreatic cancer, such as KRAS and, and BRAF, uh, are strongly enriched but the, in, in pancreatic cells, but they do nothing in HPEX. And you don't see RAS mutations in, in breast cancer. Um, likewise, I mean, there's a lot of things in black here that, that either drop out or turn on um, in both. But you see these, these ones that are colored are, are different. So here's a tumor suppressor that's uh, often found in, in pancreatic tumors, but not in, in breast tumors. And you see it starts to drop out here. And then here's some um, um, breast-specific tumor suppressors, such as GATA3. Uh, it doesn't do much for pancreatic tumors, but it drops out tremendously in breast cancer. So, um, so we're still seeing this sort of underlying architecture. What else is going on here? What else can we learn from this? Um, uh, so these, these genes, if we overproduce them, make you grow faster. We call them go genes. And if they make you grow slower, they're stop genes. So the same sort of idea that I brought out earlier, just to simplify this. So if you look at the go genes uh, and, and look at cancer amplification, you can see that the uh, HMEC specific ones um, relative to the pan cancer amplicons are enriched just like uh, the pancreatic drivers. So across all cancers, if you look at recurring amplicons, you see they're both enriched. So that means they probably have drivers. We're finding drivers here. Um, but if you look at just the things in breast cancer, the amplicons, you can see that the genes that were found in HMEX uh, behave uh, much more strongly than, uh, than those that were found in pancreatic. And uh, the, uh, the opposite is true. And uh, if you look at uh, pancreatic adenoma um, uh, amplicons that are recurring amplicons, you see a greater enrichment for the genes that are driving this sort of normal uh, pancreatic cell type. That's true for the, uh, for the GO genes. It's largely true for the STOP genes, with one exception. Okay, so here, uh, both the, the stop genes, and I didn't necessarily expect this to be true, 
but they're avoided in recurring deletions. Okay, so they pro some of the stop genes I thought, oh, you're just messing up, you know, metabolism or something. You're just throwing a hammer at things. But actually, if you're avoiding uh, them in deletions, they're probably really negatively regulating proliferation. Um, and, uh, sorry, they're rich in deletions. So um, uh, you see that in the pancreatic uh, uh, derived stop genes are much more enriched in general in, in pan cancer for whatever reason. Um, but in breast cancer, they're about the same. The p-value is actually stronger in, for um, the stop genes in, in HMEX and the recurring deletions. But this is one place where they don't look that different. If you go back now to the recurring deletions in pancreatic cancer, the, uh, the stop genes in uh, HP and E cells actually outperform, which is what you expect. So what you're seeing is that you see enrichments in amplicons that are tissue specific or and uh, enrichments and, and deletions that are tissue specific that follow the cell type that these uh, driver genes were found in. Okay, so this brings us to the question of whether there's an underlying tissue specific genetic architecture that determines which genes can control proliferation, which is what we think. Uh, if so, uh, we would expect that it would be largely conserved in related tissues. So we did the same analysis and we looked at tissues that were related to breast or tissues that were related to um, um, the pancreas and asked if their recurring amplicons and deletions behave the same way. And so for breast related, we looked at ovarian and uh, um, uterine uh, and endometrial cancers. And what you can see is that the HMEC uh, GO genes are more enriched uh, in ovarian than, than uh, the uh, pancreatic ones. And that's true in, in a uterine cancer as well. Um, um, for um, the stop genes um, and, and deletions, um, there really is not that much difference. But when you go over here to, uh, these are for the, for the breast genes, um, they, they behave about the same. But remember, the pancreatic uh, uh, stop genes were really good uh, for some reason. So they, they're about equal there. But if you look over at cancers related to, uh, uh, to pancreatic cancers, such as the amplicons in uh, stomach adenomas or colorectal cancers, now the pancreatic derived uh, uh, genes are, are outperforming breast again. And that's true also in the deletions. Here you can see that the, those are much better. So uh, this suggests that, um, that there's a relationship, an underlying relationship between these different tissues that we know are sort of related developmentally, um, and that the driver genes are, are more related. It makes sense. But this also predicts that then, then you would expect that there are amplicons, which are, I think are, as a result of these genes, the pattern of amplicons that you see in, in focal deletions would also be more closely related. And so when you do that in non-hierarchical clustering, you get the same thing. And so what you can see here is that that if you just look at uh, recurring focal amplifications or deletions here in this heat map, you can see that breast cells are closer to ovarian and uterine derived cancers in terms of what their pattern of amplicons are, and the pancreatic is closer to stomach adenomas and, and colorectal cancers. So uh, this sort of just argues that the drivers that you can detect in vitro are actually you know, reporting on something important underlying in these cells, and that this helps drive the pattern of, of focal events um, in, in, uh, in these cancers that are related. And so just a, another, another thing about uh, finding these genes, the goal here was to, to basically find some of these other drivers, not the ones driven by point mutations, but by, by overproduction. And um, these are just the, the chromosomes. Uh, these are twice the size, just because they were getting so small, it's hard to read them. But um, um, what you can see here is that uh, uh, these are the, the recurring deletions or amplifications. Uh, pink is uh, breast cancer, blue is uh, pancreatic cancer, uh, uh, and gray is pan cancer. But these are just the genes mapped on the chromosome. So, these are all in, in the amplicons. So these are candidates for new drivers that we 
found, and there's about 140 of them. Of course, we found a lot more that aren't in these regions, but uh, um, we think these are, th these are now new candidate drivers. So how important are these, these events in cancer? Um, if you look at uh, the number on average per tumor, there's about one oncogenic mutation, maybe three tumor suppressors, but there are lots of whole chromosome events, whole arm events, or focal events. Uh, and, and you have to ask the question, well, they're selected, but how important are they? What can they tell us about cancer? And so we were interested in trying to understand um, more about how these drivers are actually driving cancer. Um, so we think it's, you know, as I told you, uh, that, uh, that aneuploidy drives cancer by altering the dosage of, of known tumor suppressors and oncogenes and new ones as well. And we also think that uh, once you get you start having aneuploidy, you probably are more unstable, so it's sort of a slippery slope, so it allows you to evolve more quickly. But are there other things that are, are important? Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to get back to the, the question of, uh, of, of how important these events are, and in order to do that, I wanted to look at survival. And to do that, we decided to um, um, give each tumor a score based on its aneuploidy, the degree of its aneuploidy. So we sort of added up these different arm events and whole chromosome events and focal events and gave uh, a sort of uh, SCNA level score. These are somatic copy number alterations to each tumor. And then we could start correlating the degree of aneuploidy with different things. So one of the things we correlated with is um, drivers. What kinds of drivers are um, um, enriched in high uh, SCNA level tumors? And so here we look at, uh, at uh, the number of drivers, mutant drivers, that are in the DNA damage pathway, including BRCA1 and 2, and things like that, but ATM and any kind of DNA repair gene. And what you can see is that the more drivers that are mutant, the more uh, genomic instability, the higher the aneuploidy sort of signature is. Makes perfect sense. If that didn't work, I would have quit doing the analysis, right? <laughs> so, um, but then we went on, we found something that's actually kind of surprising, which is that we found there's a particular type of driver that anti-correlated with, uh, with this aneuploidy score. And these were mutations in the, uh, the uh, receptor tyrosine kinase, BRAS, PI3 kinase family. And what you can see here is that the more drivers you have in this, this pathway, uh, the less genomic instability that you see. Now, this is surprising to us because there's been this whole theory about um, um, how oncogenes drive genomic instability. And it, it, you hear a lot about it. Uh, it, started, it starts with the fact that if you overproduce RAS, you can do senescence and you see DNA damage. Um, in these cells, um, which we know induces senescence. But those are usually vastly overproducing RAS. And, you know, I think that when Tyler Jacks actually made the RAS mutant on the chromosome, it didn't do that. But people st stuck with that sort of uh, idea that oncogenes are inducing it. And then uh, uh, Bartek and Hal Zanetis uh, looked in early tumors and they could see DNA damage foci. And these are early, but not really early tumors. I mean, you can actually see them. So that has been going on for. 20 years maybe by then, but, but you can see foci of DNA damage, H2AX foci, which is this, uh, recognize, recognizes double strand breaks. And so since they knew that oncogenes drove, tu drove tumors and you could see damage, it must be that the oncogenes are inducing the damage. But no one's actually tested this, um, you know, and the only tests where people have done any tests is if they overproduce cyclin E, which is, we know messes up the cell cycle, they can see genomic instability. So I think that this is the, the, this is the largest family of drivers, of oncogenic drivers out there. And if oncogenes are inducing genomic instability by making DNA damage, then you should see a signal here, and you don't. So I think that whole thing is wrong. Um, okay, well, uh, so, uh, sorry guys, that's just the way it is. Um, so, um, um, so we gave them, we, this is just another way that we weighted, uh, gave the, the, the tumor scores. So then we wanted to ask the question, well, does aneuploidy predict survival? If we take these, these scores, do they predict survival or not? And so 
we looked in a number of tumors, and these are the four that we got a, a signal for um, out of, of 10 or 12 we looked at. Um, so it's not everything, but you can see that aneuploidy, the higher your aneuploidy score, the poorer your survival is. So the Kaplan-Meier plots uh, for uh, melanoma, low-grade glioma, uterine, colorectal cancer. So, and the hazard ratios are pretty, pretty good. Here's one that's 4.7, uh, but the others are around 2 or 3. But still, it's pretty strong. But we thought, to be fair, we shouldn't just do it for, you know, um, aneuploidy, we should do it for mutations, too, because, you know, that's sort of what people generally think about in terms of driving uh, cancer and driving survival. And so we, we made a mutation score also for tumor. Um, and then we got something rather surprising, which is that the higher scores, the more mutations you have, the greater your survival in, in all of these. Um, this is, yeah, here. So, uh, and the hazard ratio is really quite good uh, here um, as well. So, aneuploidy bad, which is, people have thought this before, so we're not the first ones, but mutations are, are good. So, this is really kind of a surprise, and um, <clears throat> I know some people think that they're anti-correlated, but they're actually not. Um, uh, mutations actually possibly correlate with aneuploidy, uh, and we can discuss why that is, uh, but it's been published uh, otherwise, but those are all driven by the most hypermutated samples, and when you take those out, there's no anti-correlation. Okay, so here we have it. Okay, um, <clears throat> we think that, that these higher numbers of mutations are probably better for you because the immune system has a better shot at you. So just to simplify why this is, in case you didn't get there yet. So, so now we have high and low aneuploidy tumors. What else can we do with these? Well, we can compare their transcriptomes. So we did that, and um, we looked for things that, uh, um, gene sets that were more highly expressed in high aneuploidy tumors, and what we got are cell cycle regulated genes. DNA replications, mitotic cell cycle, chromosome maintenance, you know, all the things you expect. And so what this probably means is that, that um, higher uh, aneuploidy tumors are probably more mitotically active in general. Okay, makes sense, not surprising. And other people had seen this in cell lines, but these are now in tumors. Um, so we found something else, though, that was surprising. We found that there was actually a, a set of genes that are depleted, uh, ex whose expression are depleted in, um, in high aneuploidy tumors. And uh, these are things that are associated with, uh, with the immune system. And so um, what you can see here is this is CD8 cells, interferon gamma signaling, uh, NK cells, uh, B cells. Uh, these are all uh, 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 much lower expression in the tumors than in, in more uh, diploid-like tumors. So, and aneuploidy is somehow suppressing this. Of course, you know, the tumors aren't expressing these. This is the immune infiltration, okay? So, so um, um, it looks like the higher aneuploidy tumors have a lot less immune infiltration. So what's known about immune infiltration in tumors? Well, there was a paper published by Nira Conan um, uh, last year that suggested that the immune infiltrate into a tumor positively correlates with the number of mutations. Made sense? This is, we redid that analysis here with our uh, scoring matrix here, and just looking at the, the immune signature, infiltrate, and mutation number. There's a positive correlation in three cancers, colorectal cancer, lung adenoma, and uterine cancer, um, uh, that is statistically significant. Now, the, the R squared, the R values are very low, about 0.2 to 0.3, and the P values are 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 3. Uh, and the rest of these don't have a signal. So, and that's basically what Nier found also. So, um, I just want you to point out these three tumors because now I'm going to show you what the immune infiltrate looks like with aneuploidy. And I want you to remember these, these numbers here um, on the next slide. So, so now we're looking at, uh, <clears throat> at, the, at the aneuploidy score and immune infiltrate. Of course, it anti-correlates uh, for everything except uh, lung or brain cancers, um, <clears throat> and uh, the, the uh, p-values are actually pretty amazing. Here's 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 7, 
and the correlation coefficients around 0.4, really very, very high. And for the three in which the, uh, the numbers of mutations correlated, you can see now that our R values are close to 0.35 or 4, and the P values are much stronger for all three of these. And so it says here that basically that the aneuploidy score has a much stronger effect on, um, on um, predicting the immune infiltrate. And also for 10 out of 12 of these cancers, there's statistical significance. And this is just another way of looking at this data. This is a heat map for the false discovery rate, which is sort of the p-values of p-values. <laughs> um, but um, the darker you are, the better it is. This is now looking at, at uh, GO terms, uh, genotology terms for CD8 cells and, and NK cells and B cells. And this is actually looking at a signature for those cells uh, exactly directly, Tregs, uh, NK cells, B cells, and CD8 cells. And you can see that everything except glioblastoma and low-grade gliomas um, score. Everything else has a very strong uh, <coughs> false discovery rate. Um, another uh, measure of immune infiltration is, is um, um, uh, immunoediting, and that is that if you have a certain number of mutations, you predict, um, uh, you can predict the number of neoepitopes you expect to see based on what can load onto MHC. And if you have immunoediting, that means you have a lower ratio than you expect because you're killing off the cells that have uh, neoepitopes that the immune system can recognize. The only place you can really see this in action is when you have a lot of mutations. So if you look in um, <clears throat> colorectal cancer, uh, you can see this. And so um, we, we look to see whether or not the number of neoepitopes observed over expected ratio um, was, was uh, uh, reduced. So in, in low aneuploidy tumors, you see lots of amino editing. So you only get about half the number you expect. But uh, in high aneuploidy, you get a lot more. And if you just do this with the number of mutations, it, it really has no difference uh, at all. So, um, so uh, this, this is another measure that says that um, aneuploidy is, is affecting the immune system. So uh, we can now ask what aspects of aneuploidy affect these signatures, the cell cycle signature and the immune signature. And the way we do this is we do a sort of machine learning-like program called LASSO which is a linear regression model. It basically says if you have these parameters, how do you weight them to best predict something? So the thing that we're predicting is the cell cycle signature, and the things that we're asking it to weight are either the whole chromosome or the focal events. Okay, and so um, <clears throat> what you can see here is that the things that best predict uh, the cell cycle signature are focal events. They have um, higher numbers, higher beta coefficients, that's a weighting parameter. Uh, but uh, the arm level events are actually, they do contribute. So this makes perfect sense, you know, so it's darker red on top than on bottom in general. Um, <clears throat> but this makes sense because the focal events are picking up particular gene sets. And the whole arm is, you know, uh, you get the good with the bad, but you're still getting the arms that, that are more good. But it's a weaker effect. So this makes perfect sense, okay? You know, the, the, you pick out the prize real estate as opposed to having to buy the whole block. Okay, so what about the immune infiltrate? Well, there it's quite different. In this case, uh, you uh, only see whole arm events, whole chromosome or whole arm events. This is the main driver. There's very little effect of the uh, focal uh, events. And so this argues that it's not particular genes that are driving it, but it's a property of a whole chromosome. And the property that we know about of whole chromosomes is proteotoxic stress. And um, <clears throat> so that's interesting. So then, um, you know, we, we set up um, just another analysis with a whole bunch of different parameters and asked the, the model to weight them, including mutations, uh, to predict the uh, immune infiltrate signature. And what you can see is that across all these different cancers, except for the brain cancers, the uh, chromosome arm and whole chromosome score is dominating. And even in the three cancers where you see a signal for the number of mutations, the, uh, the chromosome arm level is, is, is of higher weight. It's negative but because it's anti-correlated, but it's, it's more potent. And if uh, the area under the curve is really pretty good for these, for those of you who are into that kind of analysis. Um, 
<clears throat> I won't go into it. So um, we wanted to actually do an experiment to test this. Um, and, and so um, um, we, um, we made a, uh, uh, we took a, a syngenic uh, mouse tumor model. It's largely diploid, so you can put it into to a mouse, into a wild type mouse, and it makes a tumor. Uh, and then we made them aneuploid by treating them with a spindle checkpoint inhibitor. So this is now a collection of aneuploid cells, or heterogeneous, uh, versus the parental diploid. And what you can see here, if you just grow these in culture, the, the highly aneuploid cells grow much more poorly than the diploid cells. It's because they're aneuploid, they're sick, it's not good to be aneuploid, um, all from Angelica's work. But then we injected them into tumors, sorry, into mice to look at tumor genesis. This is into an immune deficient mouse. This is a RAG1 and RAG2 mouse. Um, um, and uh, you can see that, again, the aneuploid cells, tumors are much poorer in terms of how well they're, how, how the rate in which they grow. Uh, but now if you put this into a wild-type mouse, now they're basically the same. So the immune system is hammering the, uh, um, <clears throat> the diploid cells, tumors, a lot more than it is the, uh, the aneuploid tumors. And we think that the, uh, they're growing about the same rate because these are, don't have the burden of aneuploidy, but they're, the immune system's holding them in check, whereas the immune system has less of a, a chance at this, uh, but they grow more poorly. So this supports it. What about the immune infiltrate? Well, if you take these tumors and now uh, uh, look at particular gene sets or different cell types in them, you can see that uh, if you just look at T cell infiltrates, uh, that the diploids have a higher level of T cell infiltration. Um, and this now looks at the CD8 to Treg ratio. I didn't point it out earlier. Tregs and CD8 cells are, are lower um, in, in high aneuploid tumors. They sort of work in opposite directions. But it turns out that there are, you deplete the CD8 cells more than the Tregs. So the actual balance of, of what's left is even skewed. Uh, and you see that also, aneuploidy suppresses that as well. So uh, <clears throat> we think that what we're seeing in vivo is, is real, and you can recapitulate in vitro. Um, can these impact therapies, such as immune checkpoint blockade? Um, so we, we looked at that. We gave aneuploidy scores to patient tumors who underwent CTLA-4 therapy, and, um, and we plotted their, uh, their survival. Uh, and just focus on the top. This is uh, from Levi Garraway's lab, Van Allen et al. Uh, and you can see that um, uh, on the left, uh, the, uh, the high aneuploid tumors uh, survive and respond much worse than uh, the low aneuploidy tumors. This is a top and bottom 50%. We didn't find the best part and separate it. Um, <clears throat> um, and so the, the, the uh, hazard ratio is about 2.2. You do the same thing for mutations. They're predictive, but they're not statistically significant. You can add them together, and it actually improves the p-value and the, and the, the uh, um, uh, score for hazard ratio. And we, we did it on a second set from another set of a much smaller number of patients, you get the same results. So, um, <clears throat> so I think we're getting late here. Uh, uh, so uh, I think I'll skip my hypothetical explanation for why I think this works, because I don't really know. And so it's just a bunch of BS, but it has some pretty pictures. And <laughs> we'll just skip right through them. So I can, uh, I, don't, I don't even believe it. But uh, I had one idea. I, I think uh, we have other data I'm not talking about yet because it's not ready. Um, but um, you know, the, so we think it's working through antigen presentation. I think that is probably what's going to be. Um, we know that's important. And so the question is how do um, tumor cells present antigens? And antigens, uh, for this is now for class 1 MHC. Um, uh, usually what happens is you get whatever's turned over. Um, these peptides get pumped into the ER and loaded onto uh, class 1 molecules, which then end up on the surface and present their epitopes to um, T cell receptors. Um, so how do, how do these proteins get chosen? Um, one model, uh, well, it's known that, that the cell is, like most of the things that go on MHC 
are things that are rapidly turned over during translation. So if you had cyclohexamide, it just stops it. You know, and and uh, <clears throat> so most of them are newly synthesized proteins. They're called drips because there's this guy who thinks that they're defective ribosomal proteins because the ribosomes are inaccurate and then you don't fold right and you get degraded, but I don't believe that. I think it's too important to leave them to be random. I think there's a dedicated machinery. We just don't know what it is yet. Um, but, um, uh, but then there's also general turnover. So things that are stable but fall apart and get degraded. So those are things that have the wrong stoichiometry. Those don't get sampled here, but they end up getting degraded anyway. So it's these, a ratio of these two things, but this dominates until you have aneuploidy. And then you have thousands of proteins that are made at the wrong level. And so we think that this general turnover mechanism, and these are mostly wild type proteins, um, and, and so there's flooding through the second mechanism, and it's competing with this sort of even sampling here, and that that may throw the cell into disadvantage in terms of, of properly uh, sampling its epitope. So. Um, and thousands of proteins are affected. So this is sort of a flooding hypothesis. Um, <clears throat> it might be playing a role, but uh, I think there are probably other, other things that are at play. And when I tell my immunology friends this idea, they hate it. So, <clears throat> but I, you insisted I tell you. Okay, so just to summarize here, we think that the, the balance between growth promoting genes and inhibitory genes along chromosomes ultimately determines the selective pressure that drives somatic copy number changes uh, that you see in cancer. And this is cumulative gene dosage effects. Um, and, um, and this model surprisingly worked. Um, we think that aneuploidy is driving at least two hallmarks of cancer, uh, enhanced uh, proliferation and immune evasion. Um, and we, th we think that we've found that there's sort of an underlying genetic architecture in cells that are cell tissue specific that controls proliferation responsiveness. And that also then is responsible for part of the SCNA patterns, the focal amplifications and deletions that you observe in those tissues. And those, those appear to be uh, tissue specific and uh, shared among r related tissues. Um, uh, the immune evasion is predicted largely by arm and chromosome alterations, and we're really interested in how that works, and we hypothesize that antigen flooding might be uh, a, a possible mechanism. But importantly, aneuploidy is a much stronger predictor than mutation load for immune infiltration, and it better predicts the outcome of immunotherapy, and if we can figure out how to undo that, uh, and somehow suppress the defect, maybe that will enhance immune therapy. And of course, we all know that immune therapy is the, the hottest thing out there. It's, our, it's the best news that we as cancer researchers have ever received in our entire careers. Uh, and so we're all uh, hoping it gets even better, which I think it will. So I'll just uh, stop and thank the people who did this. The gene, Cancer Gene Island model was started by Nicole Solomini uh, in my lab. and. Um, uh, uh, the uh, Cancer Gene Island and most of the computational analysis was done by an extremely, <laughs> extremely talented postdoc, Teresa Davoli, who's on the job market now, and uh, she's amazing. And she collaborated with uh, Peter Park and Andrew Wu in his lab to do the um, sort of cancer gene dosage model and prediction of tumor suppressors and oncogenes, and with Hajimi Uno to do the survival studies. But she found the, the, the connection between uh, aneuploidy and the immune system, and I think that's going to turn out to be important. So, thank you um, for your attention. Yes, so the question is, have we found any of our stop genes that are, are um, that can predict immune infiltration? We haven't actually looked at that. Um, what I will say is that none of the, uh, of the SCNAs, uh, the focal deletions or amplifications seem to predict it uh, in our models. Um, that doesn't say, I'm not saying that there aren't individual genes, because we know there are. Uh, but um, and those are probably more sporadic 
rather than general, since we're, that signal probably gets uh, washed out uh, in the sort of large scale analysis. Um, we we have not looked in those tumors, and uh, I don't know what to predict about that. Um, <clears throat> for some reason, we avoided those in our. Uh, I think we avoided those when we were doing the um, um, the focal event analysis uh, early on, just because they we thought they would be less related, and we'd get a stronger signal from uh, the epithelial cancer. So we focused on those and sort of stuck with that data set since then, but. Yeah, they, they, they could be quite interesting in and of themselves. I have a final question. So, <coughs> so your hypothesis at the end was that if you flood the proteasome system, then you then uh, decrease the immune infiltration because that the molecules can't be displayed on the cell surface. Well, they're competing if they're you're competing. if you're you know, if there's a, uh, it's a if it's a zero sum game or saturable, uh, that you might disadvantage the the more even sampling mechanism. So, so, so proteasome inhibitors are used in some cancers. Are, are they used in so solid tumors? They don't not work, not but not most of them don't work. Yeah. Most of them don't work in solid. They don't even get in. I think. They, they, they don't even get in. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, so I was going to ask the question about the, the proteasome inhibitors and the immune checkpoint drugs. They, they would be expected to be opposite then. They, they but, would. But, but they're not used in solid tumors. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Because I think people are aiming to get some uh, proteasome inhibitors that work better. You know. But, but that, that was very interesting. So I think there's no further questions. Let's thank Steve for a great talk. And I'll, I'll turn it over to the dean's office. Well, I seem to get to come at the beginning and then come at the end. I must say the <coughs> most exciting parts of my day was to catch just a bit of the final talk. I wish I could have been with all of you for the entire day. I hope you've really enjoyed your time here at Tufts, particularly if you are not here at Tufts all the time. Um, I think this has turned out to be a terrific day. I want to particularly thank everyone who participated in the program. I think it's been uh, really great. And I'm particularly grateful for the opportunity that our investigators had to showcase just a small part of the cancer research that goes on here. Before closing and turning this back to Phil for final announcements, I'm hoping you'll all join me in thanking the sponsors of this event again, particularly the Boston chapter of the AACR, Cancer Research Technology, and the Raymond and Beverly Sackler Convergence Laboratory, not to mention, of course, or leave out the School of Medicine and particularly our Department of Developmental Molecular and Chemical Biology, which took a lead role along with all the faculty and staff who worked on the program. So please join me in thanking these people. <laughs>